Yes, that's one of my favorite bits. Oh, okay, we are ready to go? All right, we are ready to go. Okay, everybody, let's rewind and start over. Welcome, and thank you for coming to Being a Professional Con Artist. Thank you, everyone, for coming to my panel, and I hope you're all enjoying BrodyCon so far. You know, today we're going to talk about creating artwork to sell at conventions. But first, let me tell you a little bit of vanity about me. You know, ain't that great? You know, my name is Dan, but you probably know me better as Kefka Floyd. I'll be your host for this panel. You may know me from various things like the My Little Pony Color Guides, which you've seen out there for both print and digital. I've been doing these since uh, the early days of Gen 4. You also know me as a fan artist. I have a table here at the show, number 212. Please come by and buy my stuff. Because, uh, as you know, you know, uh, we've all got rent to pay and everything else. Uh, this is my third BronyCon. Uh, I've been coming here since 2012. Uh, thank you for coming by. And uh, some more things about me. I'm a designer. Uh, I've done stuff for Bronies for Good. If you've seen those Bronies for Good pins and cards and banner and everything else, I design their logo and do other things for them. I'm also a colorist. I color comics. I'm currently the colorist for Three Apples, written by Captain P. If you guys uh, want to, you can come by my table. I have bookmarks for free that have the URL. It's Three Apples, uh, Three Dash Apples, I should say. dot tumblr. dot com. Um, other than that, I'm also a professional photographer. Uh, I photograph airplanes, uh, private jets, uh, things like that. Uh, the other thing I do is, for my day job, I work in the print industry. I work for a large, faceless Japanese corporation uh, that supplies workflow solutions, plates, all sorts of stuff to customers around the world. They also do other things, but that's not really important for this. So, there are so many things you can do when you're selling stuff at conventions. And you might be asking yourself, self, what can I do to make things to sell at conventions? Well, you've already made the first step. You said, great, you're going to do it. The reason why this stuff is so popular is that even in our digital age, people love tangible things. They love being able to go out and have something to hold. Sure, they can look at something on their computer, but what's the fun in that? Computers need electricity, the power goes out, can't see anything. They want to buy something big so that they like it so much that they hang it on the wall. They also want to have tangible things like keychains and stickers and plush dolls and all this other cool stuff that you can do. So you have to ask yourself, when I go to a convention and sell things, how do I make this? Because it just doesn't come out of thin air. Everybody who's in that vendor hall downstairs had to have their stuff printed, they had to craft it, all this other stuff. It's actually kind of daunting. You know, you have to say, how can I do this? And what are we going to do to do about that? First thing you, I highly suggest you do is before you go out and do stuff, is to look and see what other people are doing. Who is at these conventions? I generally find that there's three kinds of tables that you find at anime, you know, comic conventions, that kind of thing. General rules of thumb, um, if I'm forgetting anybody, I sincerely apologize. The first one is the artist. Somebody like me. Somebody whose livelihood is as a drawer, a painter, you know, that sort of stuff. They're usually selling prints stickers, um, sometimes you might even find some people who have t-shirts or comic books. You know, these are, I would say, one of the most common and easiest, lowest barrier of entry. Because if you wanted to, you could just go to the show and just start drawing stuff. People will pay you, believe it or not, to sit at your table and draw things for them. You know, not everybody can do that on the spot, I understand, but it is a very easy way to get into doing this. Another person you find are crafters. These people are not necessarily people who do everything by drawing or painting, but they usually put things together. Uh, the example I have up here is the Paper Pony, who is also here at the show, I'm sure everybody has seen. They do things by cutting out uh, construction paper and gluing it together to make a shadow box. But crafters fall under so many different kinds of things. There are people down there, I see them, they make decals to put on cars, they make magnets, they make plush dolls. They use those little perler beads to construct, you know, 8-bit style artwork of various things. This is also, in some cases, depending on what you want to do, not a too terribly difficult thing to get in. Like if you want to do perlers, the thing is a lot of people do them, 
but they are, have a low cost of entry, so if you want to give it a shot, it's not that expensive. And last but not least, the other kind of person you find are dealers. Dealers are people who will uh, usually be a representative of some other group. In this case, I've used Wheel of Fine. Uh, Wheel of Fine is based on California, but they have booths at conventions all over the country. Here at BronyCon, I've seen them up in uh, sorry, I see them up in Boston, uh, so many cons like uh, uh, Dragon Con down in Atlanta when I went down there a couple years ago. They had a huge booth. They were, I mean, they were mobbed doing business all the time. In this case, you're usually acting on behalf of somebody. You know, they have works done by many different people. You're just there to take people's money and give them stuff. So when you go to a convention and as a vendor, you have to ask yourself, what is your strength? What do you find yourself uh, best able to do? Uh, why is my thing not doing that? You know, as you can see from all these different kinds of conventions, the Artist Alley and Dealers Hall are some of the most vibrant, exciting places to be. People running the shows want to be a, have what? Well, why can't I talk? They want there to be a wide variety of selection as possible. They want to get as many people to spend as much money as they can at their convention because that means more people coming to the convention, bigger show, more badges coming in, more autographs, more people at panels, all this great stuff. You know, anybody, you know, the, the other thing about conventions is that they're pretty much willing to take money from anybody who wants to have a table. If it's a really popular convention, you might have to go through a screening, but you know, for the most part, it's not that hard to get into and do one of these. You say, you know, it costs 200 bucks or something like that, for example, to vend here at BronyCon and have a standard table. If you're local, that's not a lot of money. You know, 200 bucks, you could drive, park, you know, bring your stuff in. I mean, I drove all the way down from Massachusetts. Usually I fly to these things, and that can have its own set of problems, which we'll talk about later. But you can't just walk into a show. Okay? You have to have a plan because even though, as I said earlier, people sometimes do just walk in and just say, I'm just going to take commissions and just draw stuff all day. But the reality is, is that most people like me, I can't really draw that well on the spot. I'm mostly a designer. I don't really do commissions. I have to have a stock of stuff to sell. And making that stock and figuring out how to do it without wasting all of my money is one of the biggest, most interesting challenges that these conventions bring for you. So the first thing as a vendor that you ask yourself, you say, how can I best express my artistic vision at my table when I sell my stuff? Because as I said, unless you're lucky enough to be here for free, sometimes people do get invited as honored guests and get tables for free. Most of us, you're shelling out money to do it. It's not only that, it's not just the cost of going to convention. It's about the cost of your materials, the time it takes to make all your stuff. All this happens, it's a big deal, you have to really even though I know most people here are artists, numbers are, can be kind of scary sometimes, we have to look at them and really think, am I making money by doing this? Because while some people are able to just go and say, oh, I'll just go to a convention, you know, spend money, I just want to get my stuff out there. For doing comics and stuff, like I did cons as a webcomic artist, and we did them mostly just to say, here, come read my comic. We've promoted everything, we've got cards and all this stuff. That's, you know, an advertising expense. And we would sometimes have prints or books or commissions to sell, but we weren't there primarily to make money, it was advertising. Most people, you know, I can't do that anymore. I have a day job, I have bills to pay, you know, so we have to make sure we're doing this without spending every single cent. So the first thing you really want to think about is what your work says about you and how you can sell it and what you want to sell at your table. We'll go through a few examples here. The first one that most people are probably familiar with are collectible prints. And prints are a common and fairly easy way for artists to get real, tangible versions of their work into fans' hands. It's not a new thing. People have been making prints of art for centuries. That's how we, uh, one of the big things we invented for printing was lithography. And they invented it primarily so they could make reproductions of famous artists' paintings. So it wasn't just, oh, I'm a patron, I have tons of money, I can go buy an original, you know, Van Gogh or whatever. You can use lithography to make reproductions of those paintings. And it's gone very down market. You can get prints in almost any style, in any way of having stuff made. And, you know, nowadays you might be thinking, well, it's the 21st century. Why would I want to have a print of something when I can just look at it on my computer? 
well, the thing is, is that uh, computer screens are generally fairly small compared to prints. Prints, you can get them as big as your wall. They make printers out there that are 60 inches wide and are roll fed. You can make it 60 inches wide and as long as this room. You know, it's really powerful. And as an artist, it's a big tool in your toolbox to be able to express yourself. But making prints is not necessarily all that easy. You know, you have to balance some things between what you want and what your customer wants. You know, when a customer is at your table thinking about buying your print, what are they thinking? Well, they're thinking, I want something high quality. I want something that'll last. I want something that's not too expensive to buy. You know, but as an artist, you know, what you're looking for is something that expresses your artistic vision. Something that's consistently reproducible so your prints look the same from time to time and something that doesn't cost a lot of money to make. You know, there's more than one way to make a print. I'll be going through them in a minute. As an artist, you need to look at all the advantages and disadvantages of how you print your work. The first one most people are familiar with are doing things with toner-based devices. Toner is what is used in laser printers and what Xerox is trying to call their digital presses. Um, there are better digital presses out there which use, do not use toner. You know, HP makes them. They're called Indigos. They're very high quality, but they cost more like offset printing, which we'll talk about later. Uh, the advantage of stuff being done on toner is that it's relatively inexpensive. You can go to most places that have these Xerox machines. They're very popular. And it's not like how it was 10 years ago when color lasers were really becoming more economically viable. Uh, the, the color quality on them is actually fairly decent, but you run into issues uh, where the, the way toner works is that they just apply layers of solid toner one on top of each other. And I'm sure if you've seen it on glossy paper, it looks like there's this big, you know, just splotch of color on it. Solid areas look like they're raised. You, you might be able to use that in an artistic way, but for most people when they look at that, you know, they'll see it and they'll say, oh, this was done on a color laser type of machine. If a color laser isn't your style, you have machines which are inkjet printers. Everybody knows inkjets because odds are you might have one at home on your desk. The problem is, is that printing inkjets at home is probably not economical for you because, as you know, Hewlett Packard and Epson like to charge a lot of money for their ink. And you generally need to use special inkjet paper to really get the best quality. But there are professionals out there who make inkjet printers, uh, inkjet prints I should say, in large quantities who can really get the cost down for you. Advantages of inkjet, it has a very wide color gamut. Uh, you can reproduce so many colors nowadays because these printers have eight, nine, ten different pigments to make all their colors. Um, they have advantages in terms of size. They make those, like I said, those printers come in roll fed up to 60 inches wide. So if you need to make something really big, inkjet is the way to go. Another format, this one's a little more obscure, but you're probably more familiar than you think you are, is screen printing. Uh, screen printing is silk screening, uh, where basically you have a giant piece of silk that has an image exposed on it. And that image allows ink to pass through onto a substrate, like those t-shirts you're wearing. Uh, t-shirts are commonly made using silk screening processes, but you can also use them to print on all sorts of substrates, like coffee mugs or even uh, a special rag paper that inkjets don't print on very well. You can do small quantities of them, and they're not that expensive. It's more expensive than inkjet, but for a small quantity where you want to do something really special, where you want to use special colors, like fluorescent colors, screen printing is one of the only ways where you can get those special colors to happen. And last, but certainly not least, is offset lithography or what most people commonly know as printing on a regular old printing press. This is something I'm very familiar with because it's you know part of my job. Printing on a printing press you, is kind of expensive only because you have to you have a decent quantity in order for it to be worthwhile. But if you do a large quantity, you'll actually find that it will be cheaper than any of the other methods that I have listed before. If you need to do 500 posters, yeah, odds are you can get them done for about a nickel each. You know, you can get them done very cheaply if you do a long run. The other advantage is you have a good uh, selection of paper. Uh, you can print full bleed, which means you can have the image extend all the way off the paper. It gets trimmed off at the end. Offset printing is how you make stuff like books and comic books. 
you know, most of you who are doing stuff at cons are probably not doing things in the quantity where this is necessary, but it is always an option. You should always say, well, if I have to make this much, uh, you should look and see how much it actually costs to have those things done. Other things besides prints that people make to sell at cons, buttons. I, for one, sell buttons. Some of you might have some of them. Uh, buttons are great because you can either make them yourself or you can have a company make them for you. Uh, you can go and get a button press and using your printer at home you can make as many or as few buttons as you want. Use the button press and just go chunk, and you've got a button. The advantage is you can make them in a small quantity or a big quantity. The downside is you got to sit there using the button press going chunk, chunk, chunk while you're making stuff. On the other hand, if you want to make a lot of buttons, you can have somebody make them for you. There are companies out there that all they do is just make stuff like buttons, magnets, uh, clips, those sorts of things. And they actually offer them in fairly reasonable quantities. You can get 100 buttons made for like 26 bucks. That's not a lot of money, you know? So I like to do things like having button packs where you have several buttons together, sell them all as a group. It's like Pokemon. Everybody wants to catch them all. So if you say, well, you can buy one or pick three, but you can get all of them for a nice low price, you know, people really like that. Other things you can do with Fun March that you can make at home. Keychains. You can buy blank keychains, print out you know, a sheet full of uh, keychain inserts, cut them out, put them in the keychain. You've just got a $5 keychain to sell for about a buck's worth of material. You know, it's, uh, I haven't really done those, but you know, there are things you can do. Uh, stickers. People love to make stickers, and that's something else you can do at home that's not that expensive because you just put them all in one sheet, cut them out when you're done, you can sell a sticker for a dollar. You know, it's uh, just something else that you can keep in mind for stuff to have at your table. Other things that people like to do, t-shirts. As you can see, I have uh, t-shirts out there, even though they've been out of print for a little while. Uh, t-shirts are tough because you have to have them made in a certain way. They have, you either have to have a long run done by a silk screening company, or there are companies that do print on demand, like uh, Redbubble where they print direct transfer right on a t-shirt. The problem with t-shirts is that even though people like them, they're expensive to make, they take up a lot of space, they weigh a lot, and you have to have sizes for all sorts of different people. So if you're not able to ship like a box of t-shirts somewhere, it can be really tough. That's why you usually only see t-shirts sold by companies like We Love Fine or really big shops that are able to afford being able to ship t-shirts and things everywhere else. Last but not least, something that lots of people always like, comic books and zines. Uh, comic books are not that expensive to make, uh, especially if you're doing your own stuff. Um, unfortunately, I'm blanking on the company that makes them, uh, but there's actually a nice uh, short-run uh, vanity press company that specializes in making comic books. Uh, I unfortunately forgot to look up who does that, so I apologize, but uh, if you, I'm sure if you Google them, you can find them. People like comic books because they're different than just print. Comic book, you can tell a story and you can collaborate with people. So instead of one person having to take the hit on ordering all the comic books or doing a zine, you can have multiple people collaborate and do something where all of you can get in. So that way you all can do a big enough order where you get 20 of them to sell each, for example. And that way, uh, everybody's work gets out there People love to buy these and they're not expensive to sell. You can sell the, the books for $10, $15. People are always happy to buy them. Of course, when you are making all these things, you actually have to go through the process of actually making them, which is, in some cases, easier said than done. Because, as I was mentioning earlier, you can do one, one of two ways. You can do it yourself, which if you're a person like me who is kind of a control freak, uh, is good. I mean, I own an Epson 3880 wide format printer. I can print stuff up to 17 inches wide. I can do those really big prints that you see at my booth. I can do really small prints. I can gang stuff up. The problem is, is that I don't recommend somebody who's just getting in this going out and buying one of those. Those printers cost $1,200, even though you can get them for $1,000 or less with rebates. The ink cartridges hold 80 mils and they cost $50 a pop. And, you know, if you're doing stuff with a lot of heavy coverage, um, you know, you're looking at stuff that can be kind of expensive to make compared to actually going out and having somebody else make it for you, you know. 
it's it's a tough thing. And you might say, well, I have a printer at home. You know, I can go through and make it. You just have to sit there and actually calculate out how much ink is used and how much your paper costs. And you say, well, it costs me five dollars to make this eight and a half by eleven print. I can only I can sell it for ten dollars at a convention. But if I go out and have somebody else do it for me, they can do it for me for just throwing it out there a buck fifty or two dollars. And so if you're doing twenty five prints. You know, that's a lot of margin you're giving away by making it by yourself. So when you're doing things by yourself, it's better to do it where you can do it in a quantity. Like I was mentioning the keychains or the buttons before. On one of those eight and a half by 11 sheets, you can put 10, 15 keyring inserts on that and just cut them up and put it in there. Your costs have gone way down by doing that. You know, and then you run into other issues like you have to have the knowledge of being able to do it. Uh, something I'll be talking about later is color with relation to printing. And, you know, if you don't know anything about color management, that can be kind of tough. You can say that, well, I'm printing this, my print is not coming out right. If you don't have that knowledge and you don't have somebody to turn to, you're just throwing money away by doing it yourself. So you should always at least consider and look at having somebody do your work for you. One of the advantages of this is that there's lots of places out there that can do this stuff from photo labs, which can often have you know, those wide format printers, those 24 inch things. They can go and make all that stuff for you. Um, or print shop. Print shops are your friends. And I'm not just saying that because they are my customers. Print shops have a wide variety of devices and machines between those Xerox machines, the Indigos, the inkjets. You know, it's worth your while to give a call local shop or look online to see if somebody can get you a quantity of what you need. They also know all the pitfalls and problems that come with printing. You know, and you can look at it as a printer is a partner in your business of being an artist. You have a strength. You could be a great drawer, great painter, whatever. You could say, well, people don't come to me to do certain things, but they do come from the things that I have strengths in. So you can look at it as going to somebody whose day job and strength is to know about all the traps. And that way, they can tell you, you know, what could probably go wrong before you spend all your money, you know? Something else, we're going to get into the real nitty gritty of this, is creating work for production. Being a production designer for many years, I've learned a lot of methods and traps, both figuratively and literally, on designing works for printed materials. That was a joke there for all you one person in here who might actually work for a printer. You really have to sit down and look at your work and ask yourself, is it up to snuff? Making prints and merch requires high quality, high resolution artwork. Is it good enough to be printed? If not, you'll need to redo it. The old words of garbage in, garbage out applies with printing. You know, at the very minimum, contone work, which is what we call things like photographs, paintings, drawings, should be at least 300 dpi or dots per inch. If you don't know what that means, you're really in trouble. But that's uh, you know what you come here to talk to me about. DPI is the resolution. Okay, I, how, how many people have here have seen CSI? I see a lot of hands going up. You know how in CSI they got the spy satellites or the spy photos, and you've got the fellow whose name I can never remember saying, enhance, zoom, enhance. That's all BS. It does not work that way. Uh, digital files have something called a resolution for raster images. Um, it's basically like a grid of pixels. So when you look at your monitor and you see your little RGB pixels, your files work in the same way. If you have something that looks good on your screen, it might not necessarily look good enough to be printed because, oops, I did it at 72 dpi. That means for every square inch on the paper, you only have 72 dots. That's where all those jaggies and ugly things come from. But if you do it at 300 dpi, that's a lot better. It'll look a lot nicer. Other works have certain considerations like line work and everything else and fonts and blah, blah, blah. That's a little beyond the scope of this. If you want to ask me more about it, you can ask me in Q&A later. You know, please do not be that person who gives a JPEG file to your printer. Okay? Unless it's a photo or something where you're you know, really doing that. But let's you've gone and designed this beautiful banner you know, with all sorts of beautiful text beautiful drawings and you've given them you know a, J a compressed jpeg file they will hate you they will curse you every minute they're working on your file don't be that person give them a high quality pdf file i'm sure you guys know what pdfs are the advantages of pdfs is that you can store natively images and fonts and line work 
so that if you do your work in Illustrator and do vector artwork, you can have an output at the actual resolution of the plate setter, for example, that the printers use, which go all the way up to 2400 DPI. So you can get nice, crisp line work. But the, the real thing where I think most people run into trouble when they're making stuff to sell is color. Now this one over here is a, a picture of the Scilab color space. That contains every color visible by the human eye, or at least for those of us who are not tetrachromats. Um, the big thing is that a lot of people, um, how many of you here are actually artists? I see a lot of hands going up, that's good. How many of you work uh, on your computer digitally in like Photoshop, Illustrator, Sci? Okay. How many of you work traditionally with like paints and stuff? Okay, we've got a pretty good mix in here, you know. And when you're working digitally, it's a little different than working uh, physically with old style paints because the way a computer monitor describes color is completely different from the way uh, things that are printed or done traditionally describe color. We've got two acronyms here. We have RGB and CMYK. Those of you astute enough to notice means RGB means red, green, and blue. CMYK means cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. That means the primary colors that are used to generate color. Computer monitors, your printed works, they all mix those colors together to create you know, more than just red, white, green, blue, purple, whatever you want to do. In the world of print, everyone relies on what's called subtractive color. That is, the models like CMYK or RYB rely on subtracting ink or pigments to get white. Because at the end of the day, what we're thinking about really is white. Because white is the color of all colors. Okay? And when you're putting stuff on paper, we're taking color away to get to white. As opposed to working on a computer monitor where it's RGB, where you're adding in red, green, and blue to get white. You take that color away to get black, okay? And RGB, uh, you know, you're used to working on a computer monitor. You see these bright, really saturated colors, and you go and you try to print something like, man, my print looks kind of dull. And that might be because you're used to looking at things on a monitor. Monitor is what's called transmissive. It means it's beaming light directly at you. Very bright, uh, shadows don't plug up very much. You know, a lot of stuff that can be really tough to actually do on a printer, but otherwise looks really good on screen. You know, going between these two methods is where a lot of people get tripped up. You know, and there are people who say, well, you know, CMYK is going to be printed. I might just as well work in CMYK inside my application like Photoshop. And you might not want to do that because that has its own series of pitfalls. You have to think of it like inks. And the problem with ink is ink does not exactly behave the same way that uh, color on the monitor does. When you add ink together, things get darker. So you put CMY together to get brown or black, those neutrals. And the reason why there's K in there is because sometimes you have to take that CMY out to put in actual black. CMY put together, it tends to turn to like this muddy brown black. Nobody likes it very much. You know? got some common problems and traps and issues that people run into when they're translating the work that they've done on their screen to a printed piece. The very first one is, my prints are too dark. It's very common because when you add ink together, it gets kind of dark. So you have to remember, uh, especially in your shadows, to not go too dark. Don't do something where it's going to have, you know, 300% or more total ink because it's just going to plug up. <coughs> Excuse me. Another thing is not all CMYK processes are the same. You might say, well, I have an inkjet printer at home. That is CMYK, yes. A printing press is also CMYK. They don't really work the same. Uh, inkjet printers, they solve their limited gamut problems by adding in extra pigments. You might notice that your inkjet printer doesn't just have CMY. It also has light magenta and light cyan. They often throw in light black and light light black. And if you're lucky enough to own one of the really expensive Epson printers, they have orange and green in there too to make up for colors that CMYK normally can't produce. And that's a problem people run into is to say, well, I've got this really bright, saturated color on my screen. It's a great looking orange, but I put it on a paper and it gets really dull. That's because when your printer or printing press is trying to make that orange color, it's really mixing in 
various levels of dots of uh, yellow and magenta to try to make that up. There's no actual orange. It's using a trick to play in your brain that you can say, well, if I look at this far enough away, this looks like orange. That's the entire basis of how printing works, is tricking you. Because if you tried to have every single color that you had on there, it would be impossible. The printing press would be a mile long with the number of inks that it would have to have. So they basically cheat by using these four inks to mix in varying ways. <coughs> Excuse me. And like I mentioned earlier, you know, the big question is, should you work in RGB or CMYK? People come up to me at uh, ta my table and they say, oh, you know, I really want to do this, but, uh, you know, should I work in, R in CMYK? If RGB is not what's being put on my paper, why would I want to work in RGB? And the reason for that is, we actually, there's a lot of people who are very smart who have put something together, together called color management. Color management is this bizarre science of taking a color in one color space and translating it to another. You can actually work in RGB all day long and you'll say, okay, here's my RGB file. I don't want to have to go and replace all these colors with CMYK. Computer, you go and do it for me. And through some magical math where it gets translated into lab color space and they're like, oh, this is where you're going to be, blah, blah, blah. It then results in CMYK colors that are a reasonable approximation of what you had on the screen. In most cases, most RGB gamuts are actually much larger than most CMYK gamuts. And even though uh, CMYK doesn't contain those really super saturated reds and super saturated greens, a lot, there's a lot of overlap between those two colors. So you can actually, for the most part, safely translate between those when you're doing a painting or a drawing or something else like that. Now, if you're not working in digital, you're working in traditional art, that doesn't mean that you can't go and make stuff to sell. You can go and make prints of it. It's very easy. If you know somebody with a high-end digital camera, they can go and take a photograph of your painting for you, and you can go and get your photograph printed, or you can scan it. The problem with most scanners is that they work pretty small. So trying to get a scanner that fits 11 by 17 work can be kind of hard and kind of expensive. That's why the photography way is really good, because if you know somebody who has a full-frame, high-resolution camera, they can just light it properly, snap a picture, and you can take that picture and just go and print it. That's how people have been reproducing uh, ever since lithography kind of fell out of fashion. People have been doing reproduction photos for decades, ever since photography was invented. It's one of the prime reasons it was invented. So that way, you don't have to say, oh, I want to do more than one I have to do on the computer. No. If you're comfortable working in traditional art, keep doing that and just get it photographed or scanned, and then you can do what everybody else does. Take it to a printer or print it on an inkjet, and bam -o. You can now make as many of it as you want, and you can have the original either to keep, or you could say, bring it to the charity auction. Say, I've got the original right here, signed by voice actors, and have it go for a thousand bucks. It's a beautiful idea. Great for helping people out. Now, when people are buying prints, they tend to look at them and say, you know, what are the things that are really important that make people want to buy them? Um, I would say that one of the biggest things is paper. You know, people don't like cheap paper. They want something that looks good. And fortunately for you, there's a lot of really good paper out there, either for inkjets or for you want to draw on it directly or for what your print shop uses. And avoiding, you know, copy paper, plain paper is number one. Do something on, if you're going to do a matte paper, which they're out there, do something on a nice, you know, attractive finish. They make watercolor paper, they make fine art paper. You can go and buy that, run it through inkjets, or the person who makes your inkjet prints can use that for you. Uh, printing presses, they can use pretty much whatever they want. You know, some papers have different uh, problems compared to others, but your printer will take care of that for you. You don't really have to worry about it. You need to think about, do I want my print to be really shiny? You can use a gloss stock. Or I don't want it to be very shiny. You can use a matte stock. That sort of stuff. As long as, you know, it's something that's thick and will actually hold up pretty well. Thin paper does not hold up well for handling. So the thicker paper costs a little more money, but it'll be more durable, won't ding, and people will be willing to pay more money for it. Other helpful things, protect your prints. There are so many people I see here at the show who don't do anything when they give people their work. They just give them print and say, here, you've bought your print, that's it. 
you can actually go out and get protective clear bags, and they're not that expensive. Yes, they add a little more to your cost per print, but they are worth it because it won't mean somebody will get a ding and they'll be coming back to your table saying, oh, I ding my print, can I have another one? That 30 cents or so you spend per clear bag will save you whatever the cost it is that you'd have to eat in replacing something that got damaged. Other thing that I'm kind of fastidious about this, I don't know how other people are, but do not let people touch things on your table. Because if people touch things, they will ruin them. I already had somebody ruin one of my ultra super big prints this weekend because they went and touched it even though there was a sign that says, please do not touch. If you're at a table, please be conscious enough to not touch anything unless you ask first. And then, you know, what you really want to think about is when you're at these conventions, you know, do you really want to do it? You know, do you really have, not necessarily what it takes, but really just the will to do it. And the reason why is that this stuff is work. You know, you're spending a whole weekend or more traveling, making stuff, talking to people all day. You know, it's, you can't just show up and just sit back at your table and expect people to just take stuff and give you money. That's not how it works. You know, and if you have trouble interacting with people, um, it is a good way to build up those interaction skills and actually, you know, learn how to sell. Because even though, I mean, I don't consider myself a salesperson. I'm not very good at it. Somebody calls me at work about a sales question. I'm like, eh, I don't want to deal with it. I'd say, you know, talk to my sales guy. He'll take care of it for you. But even if you're not a salesperson, it's still really good to at least get something to say, you know, how you doing? Uh, this is my stuff. This is what I'm selling it for, so on and so forth. It's really good experience to have, especially as an artist, because let's face it, there's a lot of artists out there. Most of the time, unless you're a big name, people are not going to come out to you and say, hey, you know, will you do stuff for me? I mean, I am at best a B-level personality. You know, people are not exactly, you know, walking up to my table and saying, hey, you know, I know you from somewhere. I do get that occasionally, but not very often. You know, there are people out there who are definitely a lot more famous than me. You know, you can't just be out there and expect people to just come and give you money because of who you are. You got to make good work and be able to go out there and offer something solid. And even then, when you do your, put your best foot forward and say, you know, hey, you know, this is my stuff, I've done the best I could, there is still the possibility that you can fail. It happens. I would say don't get discouraged because not everybody's able to go to a show and just make, you know, a bazillion bucks at their first show. If you are, you're probably pretty lucky. I mean, the very first table I had at a convention was in 2006, it was at Kineticon in Hartford, Connecticut. And my buddy and I were doing a web comic at the time. And we just had a table just to promote our comic. And uh, I will admit it was kind of a low rent table because we, I didn't have, we didn't really have signs. You know, we had a big thing up. I had a series of uh, selections from our comic strip and we were doing commissions of people. You know, we were only there really to make our money back for the table because we were local. We just wanted to advertise, but it gave me a lot of experience and it taught me a lot so that when you know after a couple of years I got out of doing that and now here I am back doing it again uh, doing it for this and for other things and that experience in a lower pressure environment really helped a lot. Bronicon is a big show there are a lot of big shows out there you can say go to a big show spend the money I mean you can try that I don't want to really discourage anybody but if you can look and see if you have a local show or a smaller show where you can say, it doesn't cost me a lot, I'm not out a lot of money, go to it and see what you can do. Because, I mean, I've been to probably, it'll be about seven cons this year. I travel, I mean, flying sucks. It's not the way it used to be, you know. Uh, TSA, they're, you know, they're not friends of mine because uh, they always go through my bags and, you know, open up my boxes of stuff and it really drives me crazy. And you have to deal with airports or driving. You know, that, that's another big part of it. People are not up to traveling, and not everybody can do that. You know, it's, it's something you have to make that call for yourself. Inventory, that's something else you got to deal with. I mean, odds are you're not going to, unless you woefully underestimate stuff, you're not going to sell out at the end of the show. Uh, sometimes a lot of people do sell out, and, you know, good for them. I'm not that way. I usually make too much stuff, so I have stuff left over. You may, managing all the stuff that you make is a big deal. Um, 
that's that's a really important thing. Like you have to say, well, I'm about to run out of something. Should I reprint it? That's a big thing you really have to keep track of. And before you know it, you might wind up with this big stack of stuff in your house or apartment saying, well, I kind of want to get out of it. What am I going to do with it? You know, you don't want to spend too much money and say, oh, well, I spent $500 making all these prints and I didn't make that money back. Well, you know, you have to be able to estimate and guess and see what you can do at the various shows. But, you know, I just sat here, you know, for five minutes being kind of negative about stuff. And I'm not a really negative person. I look at this, these experiences of going to conventions and say, you know, was it worth it? I'd say for me it was because I've learned so much from running my table, and I've met so many great people, kids, their parents, just general fans, people come up who are having a great time at the show, who love to come to these things and not just buy stuff, but also support the people whose work that they like. And I've always really appreciated that. And that's why, you know, whenever somebody comes by and says, oh, I, I really like your stuff. You know, and they take something home, you know, they take a card, they buy something, like, I really appreciate that. You know, it means a lot to me when people do that because it means my art degree has not just been a waste of money, you know. And work, I work for my day job as an OEM, you know, a lot of my design work goes into that. A lot of people are not seeing that. So this is a way for me to be able to keep my skills sharp as, uh, you know, my day job does so much stuff that the general public doesn't really see. As far as things I was scheduled to talk about, that's basically it. Uh, if people want to come up for Q&A, uh, do we have a line? Or I see a fellow, helpful fellow here with a microphone who's coming up. All right. Uh, so Excellent. Nice hat, by the way. This uh, lovely fellow will point out uh, someone who's asking a question, and I will run to that person okay. and put the mic to you. You don't have to hold on to it. I'll hold on to it. Okay. Well, it just so happens that we have a person right here up in front. I saw them. They had their hands up just for sake of convenience. I have a, I have a question sure. about um, copyright and royalties. Like yes. Uh, that is normally something I usually go through in the more general vendor focused panel. This one was more about production. Uh, that stuff, um, at your own risk. I mean, I'm lucky enough to have been licensed for some things, so I have less to worry about. But at the end of the day, you're still profiting off of somebody else's work. Um, if you're doing stuff that's transformative enough, um, it falls generally within uh, parody type stuff. I've, we actually did a panel, which you can find on YouTube. We did it at Equestria LA uh, two years ago, or no, last year. Uh, it was about the art of doing parody, and we actually talked about all the legal stuff that protects you. It was like, I mean, everybody here knows Weird Al, right? Yeah, everybody knows Weird Al. Well, the, one of the great things about living in this country is that the First Amendment gives us the right to parody or satirize copyrighted works. As long as you're not, you know, slavishly reproducing somebody's stuff and say making exact copies and reselling it as your own, you know, that's bad. Do not do that. But let's say you're doing a parody. That's why Mel Brooks could do the movie Spaceballs without having to pay George Lucas any royalties. You know, it's because you're taking it and transforming it into a new work, it's become your own. I mean, you're always going to run into the fact that you might get a C and D. Uh, I mean, that's just the reality of it. Um, but if you're good enough and popular enough, you know, some companies are more uh, forthright about it than others. Hasbro has been more willing to work with people on things. Uh, so you never know. You can always ask. Questions? Okay, I'm, I'm just getting a feel of who we've got. I see a person over there with a question and a person over there with a question. So let's, we'll get to you after her. Um, in my job, I do a lot of promotion, like events, invitations. Yep. Um, Sometimes I'm putting photographs in. Mm -hmm. What computer program do you recommend for a PC? I don't have a Mac, I have a PC. Um, you can't go wrong with Adobe stuff. Well, I was just Googling that, and they have one that just came out called Creative Cloud. Are you familiar with Yes, that? yes. Much to the consternation of everybody in the professional business because they went to a subscription-based model instead of traditional, you know, paying for it. I mean, I do all of my work basically in Photoshop and Illustrator. 
Um, for my photography, I use Lightroom, which is another Adobe product. Uh, but I use that together with Photoshop. I mean, everybody knows Photoshop and Illustrator. So if you do your work in that, and odds are, say if somebody has to fix something or change something, odds are they'll know what to do with it. I mean, I don't want to discourage people from creating work in tools like Sai or Manga Studio, because those are also really great tools for drawing. Um, but if you're doing, you know, printed work, you know, you're putting something together like that. Don't be the person who uses Microsoft Word or Publisher, please. See, see, she, she understands, she hates it. Yeah, so like, Adobe stuff can be kind of expensive because the Creative Cloud, like, Master Collection, I want to say the subscription rate on it right now is something like $50 a month. But uh, if you just want Photoshop, they have actually a promo where you can get Photoshop and Lightroom for just $10 a month, which is actually, a, in my opinion, a pretty good deal. Okay. I saw you had a question. Um, so if you're planning to maybe go to a convention and sell stuff, how much variety or like what sort of numbers of different prints would you want to aim for? Well, that's a, that is a really good question. Um, over the past couple of years, I mean, for myself personally, I've grown quite a bit in the variety of stuff I'm selling, namely because I procured the 3880. I'm able to make small quantities of stuff that before I'd have to have an, a quantity made up. Um, you, you, it's a really tough question. I mean, the trouble is that if you have too much stuff, people can get kind of overwhelmed. I mean, if you take the example of a PonyCon, um, you know, you could say, well, I could do all the main six, for example. You could have one of each, just, as, uh, just for example. You could do, say, 20 of each. And what you'll probably find out is that some are more popular than others. But even then, you'll never know. Like, some shows, some things will just go like that. You'll be like, well, geez, I should have brought more of them. It's always handy to have, on like a thumb drive, a copy of your works that you can take somewhere to get printed. Because a lot of times they're held in these convention centers and stuff. This convention center actually has a Kinko's inside of it. You know, they can actually go and do stuff for you. You know, or there's uh, other stuff nearby. Or if you're like me, at least for this con, I drove down and actually brought my Epson printer with me. So I can print out stuff at the show. I can't, obviously I can't do that at everyone because most of the time I can't drive to these things. I have to fly to them. But uh, I'd say, you know, if you're just starting out, you know, make sure you have all good stuff. Like if you feel certain pieces are your strongest piece, make sure you stick with those because people always want to see stuff that'll knock them out. If you have something that is kind of, uh, you don't really want to put that front and center. You might want to have it where someone, if, they, if it appeals to them, they really like it, you say, sure, I'll sell this to you, no problem. But uh, it's something that you'll really get a feel for with experience from some shows. Like the uh, first Burning Con that I did, 2012, I had three prints. I had the Smile poster, um, I had uh, the Wrap Up Winter poster, and I had the Forever Beneath Their Watchful Eyes poster. Uh, the Smile poster, I sold 120 of those, which I have not sold that many since. But, uh, you know, and that's another thing too, is like the tone of conventions change over time and what people are expecting to buy and things like that. And you can't expect to show up to the, to the same show with the same stuff all the time. So you're gonna have to have some turnover. So selling out is not really a bad thing to happen. You say, well, I've sold out all of these ones. I'm not gonna make any more of them unless they're ultra super popular. I'm gonna move on and make some more stuff. And as long as you rotate in some new stuff with your old stuff, you should be okay. Okay, I see some more questions. I see someone right behind you. So I'm guessing we've all seen the uh, $1 water guy. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, how legal is that to take something like a water bottle, maybe make a new label for it, and then sell it at a booth? Uh, going along the vein of copyright, is that legal? Uh, it is one uh, There's, n I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, if you wanted to make BronyCon branded water, um, I would highly suggest asking the people here if you can use it because BronyCon is trademarked. But if you wanted to make your own, you know, Rainbow Dash's secret stuff, you know, um, power to you, I don't think anybody would really, uh, I'm not sure if people would buy it necessarily. And you all, the other problem you'd run into is whether or not the venue allows you to sell food products. 
you know, sometimes you might have to have a special permit for that or the venue doesn't even want to deal with it. There are people, I know Pixel Kitties has made her, you know, gummy cola uh, in a bottle, but a lot of times she actually can't sell with actual soda in it. It's just like an empty bottle with a label on it because places have those restrictions. You know, I mean, it's a good idea. If you can do it, power to you. Don't be afraid to make me run. <laughs> I see somebody up here, and there's also people in the back, but... Get this uh, fabulous Applejack first, and then I'll send you off to the back. How do you know if you're charging too much or too less for your... Um, if people aren't buying your stuff, you're probably charging too much. But fortunately, that's an easy problem to solve, because you can actually go around and look at the vendor hall and see what other people are charging. Um, it used to be that, you know, at least bigger prints, you used to be able to charge more for them. I find you can't really do that as much anymore. Uh, which is a shame because the competition is starting to become big these days and I mean That's just how it goes sometimes, but people like it when you make a deal, you know They like it when they feel like they're getting something so that's like with the buttons You know, it's like I sell the small, you know like inch and a half buttons for two dollars each But the more you buy the more you save, you know So I do like you buy you get to pick three for five because people like to pick or you can get the whole complete set of eight for just ten bucks. So you, you, you do the math for them and say, hey, you can get the whole set, there's a discount. You know, people really like that. But I would highly suggest uh, surveying the field and see, you know, what other people are doing and try to be within their ballpark. Okay, I saw some people in the back who had their hands up, like a bunch of people over there. Uh, they're... Uh, I don't know. Start with the first one and then move along. <laughs> In transporting your stuff to the con, how would you recommend doing that? Uh, can you repeat that? It was a little quiet. In transporting your stuff to the con, how would you recommend? Ah, okay. That um, that can be difficult. The way I usually do it is if I'm flying. It used to be where I could just carry my box of stuff with me. I don't do that anymore because it's too much of a pain. Um, I have a big giant roller bag. Um, I, I pack my prints carefully into a box. Um, I use like crumpled up brown paper to act as like a shock absorber so nothing like gets damaged. And that box I put into a roller bag with a whole bunch of other stuff. As long as you don't get over 50 pounds, you won't get whacked for a fee. Um, as f some other stuff I take in like, I, all, because the pins are really heavy, I take them in my roller board bag. Um, I also take like miscellaneous stuff in the roller board. Uh, the really, really big prints, I have a big giant tube, so they get rolled up and put in a tube. I normally hate rolling things and putting them in tubes, but I can't bring the big box that they come in when I fly. So uh, my advice is just have a, uh, have a focus on making sure nothing gets damaged. As long as you package them in a safe way, uh, you should be okay. Also make sure the TSA can open stuff without destroying it. Okay, I see some people over there. Two people. Pick one. Um, I'm going to be vending sometime shortly. Um, I'm just not entirely sure how many of my prints I should be printing. It's going to be a smaller con, about 2,000. Assuming that stuff actually sells, how many would you recommend for a first time vend? Um, it's, it's really tough. You, should, you need to look at about how many people are expected to be at the show. You know. Uh, if you're just going to do one print, you know, get a lot of them. If you're going to do a bunch of prints, get a fewer of each. Um, it's, it really is tough to say. I mean, uh, you just don't know if you're going to be super popular. But as long as you have stuff and get reprints, it'll be fine. Um, 25, you know, it's, uh, I never really have, like, hard and fast numbers for that stuff. Sorry. Uh, going back to your earlier topic on... Uh, You're a little quiet. Uh, can you speak up, please? Going back to your original topic, or earlier topic, on uh, portable programs, because Adobe has moved on to their, their new subscription setup, they've actually discontinued their CS2 suite. And if you go on Adobe's official website and do a little digging for download pages, they have Photoshop, Illustrator, and all the various creative programs for free on there. Yes, but... There's always a but to that. Uh, the but is that technically it's because they shut down their activation servers. It is for people who have actually paid for their Photoshop. 
if you have not paid for your Photoshop, you are technically not able to go and get that for free. I do not recommend that you do that unless you actually own that. The other thing is that CS2 is really old. It does not run on, let's say if you have an Intel Mac running 10.9, you won't be able to run it. It's power PC only. You're screwed. Um, if you're running Windows 7, it does not run very well. If you, I mean, if you want to try it and make that work, you can do that, but we do not, uh, because I work for a software company, I do not condone the cool uh, civil infraction of software piracy. Next person. Do you recommend signing your work and numbering them? Uh, that's a good question, actually. If you're doing a limited edition, I, I do highly recommend numbering your work. Um, the joke I always make when somebody asks me to sign stuff is, you realize that it'll make it worth less. <laughs> Just because I don't, I mean, I'm just some guy. I don't think my signature really adds anything to it. But in terms of signing your work, um, I do believe it's a good idea. Uh, if you're doing traditional work, you should always have a signature or something on it to identify as yourself. For digital work, I usually have a, uh, a signature that I can just uh, pop right in so I don't have to manually sign it every time. I also tend to include like a, a screened back URL for my DeviantArt in the posters because uh, there's a problem where somebody looks at stuff and they're like, oh, where do I see that? Well, if there's no URL in it, how do they, it goes around on the internet, how are they gonna know where to find it? You know, so it's always, it is a good idea to make sure you put something on there to let people know it's your work. As far as numbering, I mean, if you're doing a legit limited edition, go right ahead and do it. Otherwise, I mean, I don't number things just because I don't. I, I would never be able to keep track of them all. But uh, if you wanna do it, Power to you. Let's see, we have three minutes left. we have any more questions? My question isn't strictly production-based, uh, perhaps closely related, though. OK. Um, I came in a few minutes late, but I don't know if you actually touched base on it, because it may have not been particularly re relevant to the panel. But did you touch on uh, interacting with your social network online, yep. like gallery sites and such? Oh, that's always a, that's always a good thing to bring up. Um, I mean, having something, you know, where people, you can push stuff for people to see is always a good idea. I mean, I guess, in, especially nowadays, I mean, it's tough to not be on Facebook or be on Twitter or Tumblr or whatever. Um, I would say my advice with that is to try to keep your personal and professional stuff at least somewhat separate because, uh, I'm not sure if people who are following you for new fan art might be interested in, oh, geez, my tire exploded or something like that. I mean, that's your call. I mean, people who follow me on Twitter are probably following me for my random song lyrics and my quotes of stuff. Um, but I have a Tumblr, which I use to post my artwork. I have DeviantArt, which I use to post my artwork. I have a completely separate website for my photography, which is not on my DeviantArt. Um, as long as you do something to go and make sure that you can at least push something and get your name out there. Uh, I do recommend doing that. I mean, uh, live tweeting at cons, I mean, I know there are people who are doing it. I mean, that's, if they want to do that, power to them. I'm usually too busy at my table selling stuff. You know, whatever you want to do, man. Um, I just have a question. Uh, what kind of printing and paper would you recommend? if I'm doing traditional art? Traditional art? Um, well, I'm presuming you want to like make copies of the stuff that you've done, right? Okay. Uh, in terms of making copies, um, a lot of, I would suggest looking at something that's like a, a fine art paper, uh, canvas style stuff. It is a little more expensive, but if you're doing something that is themed like a painting, it looks so much nicer. Uh, glossy paper and luster paper is more suited towards photos. You're probably better off sticking towards a heavyweight matte stock. You know, something that doesn't have a super serious shine to it, but still feels heavyweight and has a, you know, a good solid, you know, finish to it. And I believe it's 1.30. We're about done. Uh, if you guys want to talk to me afterwards, uh, please come to my table. It's table 212 here at the show. Please come and buy my stuff. This stuff pays for my dental work, so uh, my dentist and his BMW payments appreciate it. Thank you for coming. <laughs>